So um, I'll just, I'll, because they're not in the lab, I'm, I just want to kind of acquaint you with the idea of them. I, I won't go into gory detail about how they work, but just I just want you to know for when you see them or if you happen to see them in, in research papers that you're reading and but if you if you actually get into using uh, either or let me know because I've got like our scripts and all that kind of thing to to do it if you get into that area. So first of all, um, Permanova. So Permanova is like, you know, we talked about MANOVA, multivariate analysis, variance and discriminant function analysis um, last time, you know, and, and uh, again, if you remember what the, remember the homemade null distribution with the t-test, the use of that was really relevant when assumptions of linear models don't hold. And remember, so t-test, really basic assumptions were normality of residuals and equality of variance, remember homogeneity of variance. And this, the same thing can happen in that multivariate world. So the, the analog to that with MANOVA, you know, we were talking about, remember, and we'll, we'll look at the, the R scripts um, in a few minutes, but we we're talking about comparing male and female turtle shells or comparing the, the three species of iris that, that Fisher uh, looked at. Um, so there's still, there's in fact kind of an extension of those, of those assumptions with multivariate analysis of variance. So same deal when it comes to normality of residuals for all of those uh, response variables. So in the case of the turtles, we had length, height, and width of shells. And remember in the case of the iris, we had uh, length and width of the petals and length and width of the sepals. So the idea is within each of those groups, whether they're iris species or sex of the turtle, um, there's a normal distribution of those response variables. And there's also a joint normal distribution. So it's like they can be correlated, but there's a joint normal distribution of them. And there's, there's the same amount of spread, the same hom homogeneity of variance assumption is in play with MANOVA with an added bonus of, it's called equality of covariance matrices. So in addition to the variances of those response variables being the same in each of the groups, the covariance of any pair of the variables um, needs to be the same. That's an underlying assumption when you're doing MANOVA followed by uh, DFA. And so, and, and I guess, you know, to, one more time to bring back my bread, that means you've got not only the same kind of size and shape of loaf of bread for each of the groups, like for each of the turtle sexes, for example, but they have exactly the same orientation. They're not on top of each other, that's the, hypothesis we're testing, but they have the same orientation, in other words, the same variability and covariability in those, in those response variables. So if we're not, we're often uncertain about whether or not those assumptions hold, just like we were in the case of the t-test, and, and to enable uh, testing that that null hypothesis that you know the turtle shells the sexes have have the same shell uh, morphometrics or the irises they have the same floral characteristics test that null hypothesis um, 
one of the approaches that we can use is to go to this this randomization technique uh, where we basically create our own null hypothesis distribution and and we can do that and i said the same thing i mean you you folks did the homemade null distribution with the t-test um but i mentioned at the time you can do the same thing it, you know the the script gets a little bit more complicated but it's basically the same idea where you you shuffle the data so that you know the tags that are on it with respect to um, the sex and the habitat of a turtle for example um, you, you shuffle the actual values for turtle measurements among those and that way just like in that that homemade null t-test you generate a null hypothesis distribution and then you see where your actual data test statistic fell uh, relative to that null hypothesis distribution so it's same thing happens with terminova in in a multivariate context but the weird thing weird and wonderful thing about terminova is that you're actually working rather than working on values of shell length height width and so on you're working on distances between objects within and between among the groups and you're so you're seeing if if you, if you think about remember back when we did the um, the ordination the, the nmds ordination of turtle shells so every point on that graph was a turtle shell and the points that were close together had very similar values the points that were far apart had very different values for those shell measurements and the the sort of the the starting point for either that type of ordination or um, the classification that we did remember with the tree and everything is the distance matrix so what what happens under the hood with Permanova is that you've got two types of distances one is within a group within the turtle sexes for example so distance from one female turtle to the other or one male turtle to the other and the other distance that you have is the distance between a female turtle and a male turtle so that between group distance matrix so again without boring you with the with the details of the math what you're doing it it's very much analogous obviously to analysis of variance where you're you're comparing variation among the groups to variation within the groups you know you're you're generating that f test and and basically concluding that if variance among divided by variance within indicates a significant amount of variation among the groups relative to the amount of scatter you're getting within the groups then you're going to reject the null hypothesis and again you're doing the same thing with Permanova, only you're talking about distance between individuals within the group relative to distance between individuals in different groups so it's still the same among versus within but it's with distances rather than the actual values of the variables and and as I was saying it's most often used actually it was originally developed for use with with species data so you know people like uh, like Flavia who work on um, species abundance like macrophyte abundance for example in different areas so they have they have community data they have a bunch of species and they have their abundance at, at a bunch of sites and species data are famous or infamous for not holding to the assumptions of ANOVA whether univariate or multivariate you know they have weird distributions that are based on many things including where's the optimal sort of environment for this species versus that one um, 
what's the effect of having this species presence on um, this other one's abundance, all that kind of stuff's going on. It tends to lead to situations where um, there's something other than the, the normal distribution of residuals within each group and certainly not a multivariate normal distribution and lack of doesn't you, the data don't tend to hold to that assumption of equality of variance or equality of covariance among the groups so that that was how permanova came to be but it's used in a whole bunch of contexts now including in all the research areas um that folks in our class um, are in. So, and so I just wanted to have a look. Again, we're not going to do it in detail. Um, you might come across it, but here's kind of what the what the results look like. Let me go right here. Um, there's there's a bunch of there's a bunch of pretty nice um, R packages that. That different folks have developed to uh, to do permanova, um, and and so I just I just picked one of them that's fairly decent, and you just you just see a clip of the of the results context console there in the upper left, and then a plot uh, in the lower right, um, and and you can see this is this is an ordination plot. Um, just showing you this is the this these are the actual turtle shells, um, and you can see the F ellipse there towards the middle of the plot are the female turtle shells, and then the male turtle shells, and you can see the vectors going from individual female turtle shells to what's called the centroid of the group of females, and so. And it's looking at, I mean, one way to think of it is looking at the distance from each of those individual fe uh, female turtle shells to the centroid, to the average of all of them, where the F in the box is. And so that's a set of distances. And then you have a set of distances of the male turtle shells individual turtle shells to their centroid, the M in the box on the, on the right there. And it's, and it's comparing that variation within, within the groups to the difference between F and M that you see here, which is the difference in ordination space between female and male turtle shells. So yeah, pretty intuitive. And then, and then again, the actual statistical test, you can see a kind of ANOVA-like uh, table in the top left there, and you see a p-value, which is uh, less than 0 0.001, highly significant. And what that's, what that's based on is randomization of the data, and, and there's nothing particularly sophisticated going on there when it's, it's coming up with a number you know, just like, just like that uh, question, the, the homemade T di uh, T uh, null distribution in lab two. So it's coming up with a number that describes the variation between the groups relative to the variation within in distances. And it's shuffling all the values for length, height, and width of shell, calculating that number calculating it again. So, you know, doing it a thousand, 10,000 times, and then comparing the number that you actually get with the real data to that. Again, same way we did before. So, so, so that's permanova in a, in a turtle shell, not a nutshell. And, and uh, as I said, very easy to apply this to two-way ANOVA or whatever. If anybody uh, is interested in applying that to their, their research data, happy to talk to you offline and and give you what I think are the best uh, the best packages for doing it. So that's Permanova.
so the other thing I wanted to mention again, and, and there's, I'm kind of scraping the surface of a huge iceberg here. Um, it's kind of a double analogy, I think. But anyway, um, random forests, which um, those of you in in my area, and I know there's a few of us, you know, sort of aquatic ecology. I was joking with a colleague. I'm going to this conference in uh, in early June, the Society for Freshwater Science, and I think it was last year's version. I was there, um, and joking with a colleague that we we should have done a kind of a search of the abstracts for the phrase random forest we probably would have found it 30 or 40 times at the conference because it's it's become especially in i mean at least i guess i'm most obviously most familiar with my my uh research area but in my in my uh area of sort of bioassessment aquatic ecology uh random forests are really becoming uh, used a lot and somebody may or may not run across them in the, in the paper they're going to review at the end of the term but anyway it is it is a version of so-called machine learning I'll, I'll try to explain why that is in a sec and um it's a it's a totally different version of building the random forest is, as the kind of the name applies, it's a huge set of trees, trees in the same sense as we were looking at when we did classification a few weeks ago, um, but uh, more along the lines of, unlike, you know, we, we were putting together that hierarchical tree, which took individual observations, objects, and, you know, put together the most similar and put together the next most similar, either individual observation or, or group of observations and so on until you get one big mass. Random forests uh, are based on, on decision trees, which are kind of like looking the other way around at a tree. So, um, and what you're trying to do, and it, it's how a lot of so-called machine learning works, um, or at least what's going on kind of in background. And what you're trying to do is do the best job you can at guessing what an object's group or value is from some candidate predictors. And, you know, it, there, there's a million, I'll, I'll probably, I'll drop a couple of examples of the, uh, the resources that explain, you know, YouTube videos or whatever into the module today. There's a million uh, attempts at this, and they but they always use examples like trying to predict um, what the maximum temperature is going to be tomorrow, what the high is going to be tomorrow, based on some candidate predictors, things like that. But you would like that, Omar, because that's sort of <laughs> what we were fighting with with your data set a few weeks ago. But um, anyway, just like with Permanova, there's no, you know, in doing this prediction, which we've done lots of, you know, model building with when we're trying to predict something from something else, but there's no distributional assumptions, really basically no, no assumptions underneath it at all. And again, there's a ton of, there's a ton of our packages you can get to, uh, to do random forest. Um, so I'll give you an idea, and that, again, this is this is Bob's non-tech, <laughs> hopefully understandable, just idea what your appetite may be for random forests, and then and then if it seems like something that maybe is relevant to the the, the stuff you're working on, we can talk more about it offline. Anyway, the the first thing you have to kind of wrap your head around with random forests, which Again, I'm always tempted when I when I review this stuff. Oh, I should have a multivariate question where we do a cart. But anyway, I think you'll get the idea pretty pretty quickly here. This is a classification and regression tree um, that you're looking at right now, and the idea behind it, you know, the old 
style phrase for them and lots of people still use it is a decision tree so the idea behind a decision tree or, or a cart which is short for a classification regression tree is that you you've got a set of predictors think of it as a set of predictors in this case this is the same based on the same data set you know fishers iris data those three species of iris, um, Setosa, Versicolor, and Virginica. And you've got four variables that you can use to predict what species you're looking at. So it's it's kind of, it's the same problem that we were looking at with MANOVA and BFA last time. And it's, actually, that's what I have in the script. Um, that we'll look at in a few minutes. But it's kind of, I don't know, not turned on its ear is not really a technical phrase, but uh, so if we if we start up here at node number one, that's the one in the little box right at the top here. And just imagine we've got we've got a plant in our hand and we can do measurements. And what we get in that measurement will will determine which way we go in this decision tree. So we we measure the petal on the plant, the length of the petal, I should say. And if the petal length is less than 1.9 centimeters, then we're going to conclude that what we're what we've got in our hand is iris setosa. And it turns out that, you know, number number for fishers, the Irish data set, we had 150 plants. And it turns out that every single plant in that set of 150 that has a petal length of less than 1.9 centimeters is Iris Satosa. So that's why it says here, node 2, n equals 50, they're all Satosa. So what what CART has done, again, kind of underneath the hood here, is it has these four candidate uh, variables, petal length, petal width, sepal length, sepal width. And it's figured out that the best split, the best way to hive off a group that's as similar as possible with respect to species membership is to divide the plants, the 150 plants, on the basis of petal length. And it determines the best petal length, you know, where to put that div dividing point. So that's all happening underneath the hood, as I said. And that's resulted in this first decision point getting us one of the species, you know, with absolutely no error. If the petal length is greater than 1.9 centimeters, we go the other way in the decision tree to this node number three. And we measure the width of the petal. And if the width of the petal is more than 1.7 centimeters, then we're going to conclude that it's Iris virginica because all but four of the virginica are, are in that group that has a petal length of greater than 1.9 and a petal width of greater than 1.7. And so four of them don't. And there's also, um, oh, it's, uh, how many versicolor? There's a small number of versicolor. It looks like it looks like one, but my numbers are uh, unless unless these two here are slightly. I guess they may be slightly uneven. But anyway, this this node here, node number seven, 
that's basically giving us a virtually perfect call for iris progenitor. Okay. If we go the other way with this with this decision tree with this cart, and the pedal width is less than 1.7, then we're going to go to node four, which is yet another decision point based on pedal length. So notice we you might think, oh, well, we've used pedal length. We've got to now use something to do a sepal. No, it's at every stage here, it's considering all four of those variables and saying, you know, which one is going to be the best at getting us the most homogeneous groups, one of the two groups at least. And so with this fourth uh, node here, if the pedal length is less than 4.8, so we know it's greater than 1.9, but it's less than 4.8, then we're virtually certain it's versicolor. So most of the verse colors have this combination of traits, a petal length greater than 1.9, a petal width less than 1.7, and a petal length less than 4.8. The final group with a petal length of greater than 4.8, it's a toss up. You know, there's, there's some versicolor, there's some virginica that are there. That's kind of the the uncertainty and remember back when we were doing the and we'll see it again in a minute when we were doing the dfa of the three iris species these two species just overlapped a touch Satosa was way out by itself but that's what we're seeing here anyway so this this is an example of a, of a classification regression tree uh, in this case we're predicting a group you know which of the three species based on um, those four floral measurements. The other thing you can do with carts is predict an actual value. So you could, you could predict uh, the height of the plant or some other aspect, quantitative aspect of the plant. So, so carts are very flexible and again, kind of like that DFA model we were talking about, they're just using the information in your measurements to make as good a prediction as possible as to which group the, the plant's in. So, and unlike MANOVA DFA, there's no, as I was saying, there's no distributional uh, assumptions or assumptions full stop in this. It's really just, optimizing that, that split point at each of those nodes. So that's CART. And that's kind of the first thing you got to get clear in your mind before we get to the random forest. So this is essentially what's behind building one tree. And now we want to talk about making a forest where things get a little bit more um, complicated, but I just wanted to make sure everybody kind of understood carts and and carts in themselves before you even get to random forest can be valuable. I had a grad student uh, a few years ago, uh, Sonia used several carts <laughs> and and actually NMBS quite a bit in in looking at. She was doing uh, kind of the the use of community science by conservation authorities in Ontario and, and textual analysis, stuff like that. It was really cool thesis. But anyway, she she used carts in a bunch of contexts. So, so we have this decision tree kind of approach. And then um, this is the <laughs> this is the exciting graphic um, uh, that kind of is the climactic moment, believe it or not, of random forests. So, and, and like I said, I'll, I'll put a couple of uh, links if you're, if you're interested in, in getting further in this, or you're trying to understand a paper that you're, you're reading that uses it. But, um, but the idea with random forests, and I'll, I'll, I'll use the, uh, the iris data as an example where 
you know, we had that quite, you know, pretty simple data set, 150 plants, 50 from each, each species of three species. So what you do with random forests is, where does the random part come in, I guess, first thing. So you randomly sample that data set of 150 trees. What, you, what you're trying to do, I should have prefaced by saying, is you know it, it's great to get this kind of a result, but it's kind of, it's like fitting a, regression and then you have the estimate uh, of the slope and the intercept of the regression based on the data if you're trying to build a strong prediction that'll work and that that's why it's related to machine learning that'll work if you know if we opened a nursery together and we want to be able to quickly tell which species the plant is just by get, having those measurements um, we want it to be a robust predictive model not just bound to the data we use to build the model. And what we're looking at right now is a tree that was that's totally bound to the particular data we use to build the model. And it might not work so good when we get, you know, another 500 plants coming in from from the Netherlands and we got to quickly classify them. So the way that random forest works is it says, okay, let, let's take this initial data set of 150 plants and I'm going to randomly, with replacement, I'm going to randomly pick out a, a new data set of 150 plants. And that means you're going to pick out a set of values, those four values out of a hat, and add them to the data set. Then you're going to put that piece of paper with that plant's measurements on it back in the hat, and you keep you're going to keep randomly picking observations from that hat. You keep replacing it, though. So it's, this is different than dealing out the observations randomly among groups. You're creating a new data set, which is a random sample of the original data set. So you got a randomly generated data set from, based on your original data. And then what you're going to do, which sounds totally weird, is you're going to randomly pick a subset of those four measurements to base a tree on. So it's like if we went back here to node number one there and said, OK, I'm going to randomly pick one of the four measurements to base this node on and, and get the best split I can with this data set. Then I'm going to randomly pick a subset of maybe one or two to get this other node and so on. And I know that sounds, I mean, I won't expect you to wrap your head around that immediately. <laughs> it sounds so totally weird. You might say, why don't they just pick the best one for each time? So what you're trying to do is, as often thousands of times, build that whole forest of trees based on, first of all, random, randomly picking a set of observations from your original data set, and then randomly picking the variables that you're gonna do those splits on in the decision tree. So you're gonna end up with thousands and thousands of trees. Again, the, the kind of the original basis is that data set, but there's been lots of randomization going on in terms of how well you know, what the data set, the actual data set you have, um, which variables were chosen to actually uh, create the split points and how well they did. You know, some variables you might choose, like maybe sepal width, not going to do that good a job at splitting up the species. species. So there's going to be variability among those thousands of trees and how well they do with the known identities of those species. And that can be quantified. So what you end up with is this kind of non-exciting plot, especially the lower right, because what people generally want to know is, okay, what was the, what, what were the variables that were really important 
you know, if we look across all those thousands of trees and we look at how well the thousands of permutations and, and randomly generated data sets and, and predictor, randomly chosen predictors did, what were the variables of the four? And how did they rank in terms of how well they divvied up the plants among the three species? And I won't bother to explain mean decreased genie. That's the x-axis here. But the bottom line here is this is showing us that petal width and length, and we kind of saw that with the actual single cart that we did. They, over and over again, were super important in defining what you know, the separation of those three species. And that, and, and it seems like, oh, gee, all that trouble just to get that. I could have told you that with this, but yeah, that seems really, really trivial. But remember, this is a simple example data set, three species, four things we've measured. This is also true, and it's used when you have 100 candidate predictors. And you're randomly picking out three or four to, to find each grade point. And you're seeing over thousands and thousands of trees that you've constructed that, yeah, there's a there's two or three or four variables that repeatedly are very useful in defining which groups are which. So that's that's random forest. And and as I said, it's becoming hugely uh popular in, in my area, you know, oftentimes people use it to define different sorts of ecosystems or ecosystems that are either degraded by human activity or not. And which of the variables were most effective at predicting whether they're degraded by human activity or not. So it can be it can be really useful, quite cool. A lot of the value of it is, you know, going beyond obviously what I've shown you here in describing exactly how do those, you know, well, what's the what's the hypothesis about how those variables might explain the, in this case, the three species in the sort of trivial case, but in my case, why these these particular variables were really effective at um, classifying ecosystems into degraded by humans or not. So, so that's random for us. And uh, as I said, um, let me know if you think it would uh, might be useful with your stuff, and uh, and I'll put you on to some some great packages to to execute it.